my sugars are readjusting, and so I'm going through these kind of weird deals that probably only, you know, I wouldn't say I'm having hot flashes, but, you know. But on the other hand, it's, uh, it's been a very strange experience how my body's been readjusting. And so my sugars are spike and go down and spike and go down. And when that happens, then, uh, of course, I go through this thing. So I just wanted, wanted you to know I'm standing up on the inside, though. So he's worthy. Well, we're going to show a uh, clip here for Celebrate Recovery, and if we could dim the lights, turn the volume up, and go ahead and start it, that would be great. My name is Dolly. My name is Sector. My name is Dan King. My name is Javier. My name is Becky. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Two struggles with sexual abuse, codependency, anger and control issues, sexual addiction, the struggles with sexual addiction, control and sexual abuse. My struggles began when I was 11. That was the first time that I was abused. I grew up in an alcoholic um, family with a father who was very abusive. I didn't think I struggled with uh, sexual addiction until about um, three years ago when, um, when I tried to, by myself, quit um, being unfaithful to my wife. It wasn't until God brought me to celebrate recovery that really opened my eyes to the truth about who I really was and realized the lie that I had lived for so long. I came to CR because I was extremely depressed, suicidal, hopeless, um, and had basically given up on life. I was a non-believer and had no hope left. I realized that the pain of dealing with a recovery, not trying to stay sober, but a recovery, uh, was less than the pain that I was causing other people. There was a calling. Um, God just called me. A person that I work with, who I confided in, who is a strong believer in Jesus Christ, has a great walk with him, uh, told me about CR. And then, uh, and then when I went to my counselor, she told me, she reiterated, Celebrate Recovery, and that's kind of when I started looking for a group, a Celebrate Recovery group to, to attend. And that was three months ago. Celebrate Recovery helped me understand that the deep-seated shame was causing me to have behaviors that might have been okay socially, but they weren't okay with God. The program that makes a difference is because it's Christ-based. CR has given me tools. It has, um, it has given me um, accountability partners. I'm able to operate from a much healthier place today because of the help that I've received in CR. Celebrate Recovery has just offered such a support and such a connection and an understanding that I can be loved, not, not a way just to uh, be alone anymore. It's a family. Because of God's grace and Celebrate Recovery, I am able to help others. I'm a better person, mother, daughter, a wife, I am able to deal with my life every day. I am able to more completely love my children and others in my life. I am able to get up and function every day. I now have a great wife that loves me, that accepts me for who I am. I have a woman that stands by my side and has an understanding. I have a better relationship with my kids. I have real friends that I can reach out to and my life is just better. I am Dan King.
I am Becky. My name is Javier Blanco. I'm Dolly. My name is Sector. And I overcome. Because he overcame. So uh, if we could have Pastor Dave Amstead, just in case you're new, just stand right up there. We're just, uh, I just want you to know that I'm 100% behind this program, behind our brother, Pastor Dave Amstead. He hits it up uh, for us here at the church. And if you're struggling with any of the, the three H's, uh, hurts, hang-ups, or habits, well then uh, come and join Wednesday night, 7 p.m., if you know somebody, a friend, invite them. And I'm, you know, I've, I, uh, I know that Pastor Dave Amstutz will really help you out. He's walked through these things like many of us have. And what better way of getting a teacher that has gone through these things that have had to adapt and to change. And when you submit to Christ, on the way is change. Let's give Pastor Dave Amstutz a big hand. That was a great clip, wasn't it? Well, ushers, if you'll get ready, we're going to take up our tithes and our offerings this morning. recognize that it's what Jesus said it's in the Bible Matthew 6 don't worry why do you worry you know the children of Israel after they left captivity and went back to Jerusalem to try to rebuild the temple and how it got opposed by everybody that was back there and they gave they, they got all discouraged and gave up and they started building their own stuff. Well, they went running after their own stuff. They gave up. And, uh, hey, they got their eyes off of the prize. They got their eyes off of the treasure. And they weren't very happy about it. And there weren't any blessings coming their way. But uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says that we are not to worry about our life. I want you to look at the birds, and I want you to look at the lilies. Look at those guys. They don't sow. They don't reap. Aren't you more valuable than they? Why do you worry about stuff? Clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin and yet even Solomon in all of his glory wasn't clothed like one of them. Oh, if God clothes the grass of the field today which is, and tomorrow's thrown into the oven, won't he much more clothe you? So why worry? Be happy. Why worry? Be happy. Of course, the key here is that your treasures are in heaven. Your eyes are... On the kingdom, your eyes are good. Your, the eyes of your heart, your motive, and your intent, of course, is pure. It's on heavenly things. God's rule, God's kingdom coming, and not on, on the earthly stuff. So don't worry. Be happy. If your eyes are on him and his rule, he's going to take good care of you. Because what does he say? Jesus said, don't worry. Your heavenly father knows what you need. Amen? Amen. Hush, just come on down here. While they're coming, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, this morning that you're such a tender father. You care for us so much. Oh, if, if, um, 
If you're like a father, Lord, you said that you would give us every good thing. You've given us the most perfect gift. With him, won't you give us everything that we need? All you ask is for our hearts. This morning, we have come to give you our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, while we're taking up the, uh, the tithe and offerings, we have another clip uh, on, for Sunday school. And let me share with you, I already got, I've been getting feedback in how uh, the, these last couple of services, uh, Sunday school teachings on Joshua have been really meaning a lot to a lot of people. Uh, excuse me, thank you, Joseph. So I don't know why I'm hooked, hooked on uh, Joshua, but Joseph, Bill and Lauda have been conducting that and cross-pollinating, and what I've been getting has just been real rich. So uh, come to Sunday school and grow. Grow with us. Grow with God. So let's show that clip, if you don't mind. Turn the lights down and have the volume up. Thank you. People are searching for something. They don't always know it's God they're looking for. They seem to look for him in the wrong places. God says people will find him when they search for him with all their heart. That sounds easy, but it's not. I think churches are supposed to help people find God. if some churches have stopped helping. Some people know where God is, but they keep running from Him. Maybe they'll bump into Him. Accident. If they do, I don't think it was an accident. says he's come to give you a big life. We should help people remember that. Amen. Go to Sunday school. Encourage somebody to, to go as well. Mike? Well, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. You're getting better. Getting better. Good to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> That's a little more a little bit like a church. 
We want to welcome all the visitors we have, friends that are visiting Live Springs today. Thank you for coming to worship with us. Um, let's see, a couple announcements we have today. Uh, want to thank, first off, I want to, how many of you were at that uh, special service we had on Tuesday night? Was it Wednesday night? Wednesday night. Uh, Bishop God do well. Uh, really, really amazing service we had here. Uh, uh, just, just God just, was sh just downloading things to me. And, and uh, I just wanted to just to say how awesome that was. And, you know, today, as, as we're going through this video of uh, Joseph, you know, somebody made a comment back there that Joseph knew he wo who he was in God, right? Uh, even though where he was in the pit, somebody made a comment that Joseph had, didn't have an identity crisis. And, you know, when I was coming up here, he put this word on my, on my heart, and I wanted to share it. That Daniel eleven thirty two says in the back part of it, but the people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. And that's what I'm believing here for people that are here, Life Springs, you guys that we're not here by chance. And I thank you that God's going to do great exploits through us in Jesus' name. All right, so November 1st, we have a healing team meeting at 430, and then right after that is the power of his presence. It's a really awesome ministry we have here, headed by Miss Barbara. Uh, it's a really good time to come here and meet and stay in God's presence and hear what he has for us. And really, really awesome. Youth Connect is November 3rd. Uh, that'll be from 7 to 8.30. And again, we saw the video November 4th to celebrate recovery. Uh, again, with Pastor Amstead. Really, really awesome ministry. And uh, we're having, we're going to talk about this, the Victorious Parroting Conference. Parroting Conference will be November 12th through 14th. So thank you for being here this morning. Bless you. God bless you. Well, we have another clip. Lower the lights and turn up the volume. Something is terribly wrong that is making it harder and harder to live a godly Christian life as individuals and making it extremely difficult to hold our Christian families together with everyone serving Jesus. In every generation, no matter how bad or how dark things got, no matter what kind of persecution broke out, God has always preserved a remnant. Now is not the time to walk in fear. This generation of parents, grandparents, young people, and leaders have been called into the kingdom for just such a time as this. Waking up knowing there's a reason All my dreams come alive Life is for living with you I've made my decision You lift me up, fill my eyes How many of you? Uh, how many of you know people with children? Okay. Well, all right. There's uh, flyers in the back. This is an amazing opportunity for our church, for each one of you, to expand and grow the kingdom of God in Liberty Hill. Um, every parent, not just Christian parents, but every parent, wonders if they've uh, if they're doing it right. They wonder, have I damaged my kids? Are they going to need therapy? and counseling. Um, they have doubts about, uh, you know, what's going on, and they struggle with many of the same things that we do, even if they're not in church. So this is an amazing opportunity to reach out to parents in our community for the, a conference, an opportunity to come, and they might come thinking, I'm just going to get a few practical uh, bits of advice. I want some tips and tricks uh, to help, you know, keep my kids from being rebellious and slamming doors and, and disappearing into their uh, personal devices for hours at a time and wearing headphones to the dinner table and who knows what's on their mind. But they might come thinking that they're going to get a few, you know, uh, some good advice 
and encounter the Lord. They might come to this meeting, these uh, three, we're going to have three meetings, uh, just to let you know, Thursday night, Friday night, and then Saturday morning. Three sessions, Parenting for a Breakthrough is the first one on uh, passing the baton to the next generation and capturing your kids' hearts uh, so that your influence on them uh, outweighs the, uh, the influence of, uh, of this culture in crisis. The Friday night session is called High Tech Parenting, how to deal with uh, the technology that's come into your home, the, the days when we could just shut the door on the world and turn the TV off and our household is now safe from evil influences is long gone. And there are, you know, Things right, right inside your home, coming in through the internet and social media and Snapchat. And uh, anyway, there's only uh, the, the approach that we have to take as parents is much different than a generation ago. And then Saturday morning, "Me and My Big Mouth" is the name of the uh, message, and it's uh, that idea of are we doing are we doing things right? Have we reacted in a wrong way in anger to our kids? Um, you know, is our discipline godly, and, and have we dealt with the difficult situations that come up in a right way? And we're going to talk about some of the knee-jerk parenting responses uh, that, that we're all guilty of and, and how to correct those and how to bring um, Holy Spirit-led parenting into our household instead of just parenting by emotions. So these are awesome sessions, wonderful opportunity to reach out if you've been looking for a way to be... Uh, connected with your neighbors and invite people to church and break that awkward, uh, break the ice and, you know, the awkward silence and maybe meet your neighbors. This is a great time to do it, great opportunity to do it. So, anyway. Good question. As of right now, we have no plans for child care. Um, we will, uh, it's, the admission is free. Uh, we will take up a love offering to cover the, uh, the costs, uh, travel expenses of our speaker, as well as to, to bless him. Uh, Pastor Doug Cherry, I've heard speak. He and his wife on several occasions at Acquire the Fire events. They minister to parents. Their particular niche is parents of teens and tweens, and they have walked through the fire. They have a, a awesome testimony of God's restoration uh, from some things that happened uh, right inside the healthy confines of a thriving church. Um, but I won't, I won't steal their, uh, their thunder. Anyway, Pastor Dave? Oh. oh, Pastor Bill, Brandon? We'll be bringing the message this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's just begin and turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer and ask for his grace, his anointing, and his power to come. Yeah, Lord, we just lift up the name of Jesus here this morning. We just thank you, Lord, that you've already revealed your presence here in our midst. You've already started to move in a mighty way, calling us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be alive in you, Lord. And we do celebrate all that you're doing in our midst. And Lord, we just invite you to come. And Lord, as we speak your word, as we proclaim uh, the vision that you've had over this church and over this body, I pray, God, that you would just blow like a wind through our midst, that you would revive us, that you would renew us, that you would bind us together in unity, that you would cause your name to be made great through us to the nations, and that we would come to a time this year where we see the fulfillment of promises that have been spoken from the very beginning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today's message is titled, The Promises of God. In the beginning of September, Bishop Ron began a series where he started to talk about vision. And that series began in response to a burden from the Lord that we reconnect with Jesus and with his purposes and callings and destiny for our lives and for our church. The scripture that was used through that whole series was Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3. The prophet writes, write the vision 
and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The first thing that we see here is that God tells the prophet to make the vision clear so that people who see it can run with it. And what I love in this church is there's so many different ways you can say what God has on his heart. This pro- the prophet loves to use the word vision. I love to use the word dream. But the point is, if we don't have a vision, if we don't have a dream, if we don't have a, a revelation of King Jesus and of his purposes and destiny for our lives, for our church, for our city, for our nation, for the nations, then we'll so easily miss what God has for us. And so this burden that got into Bishop Ron is that we need to reconnect, that we need to see again, that we need to believe again and connect with what God wants to do in our generation. You see, when you don't have that vision, you will so easily follow other visions in your life. You'll start to wander astray, and you'll start to go into darkness. And you may still love Jesus. You may still be a Christian. But you've stepped out of where the river of God is moving through the nations to bring healing, to bring transformation, to bring deliverance, to bring the kingdom of God to a world so desperately in need. We start to dream about other dreams like how do I pay my bills or, or, or how do I deal with the stress of my life or how can I just uh, deal with my health issues. And these are all important issues under the big issue, which is the kingdom of God. And so Bishop Ron began this series to call us back to dream again, to to stir ourselves up, to remember what life is all about. I I was speaking with Pastor Dave Amstutz, and he was telling me about how Winky Prattney was used by God to wake up many in his generation. And the way he did that is he painted that picture before the people in such a way that they said, I can see it. I can see what will happen if people believe in Jesus. I can see what will happen if they sell all to follow Jesus. And they said, I'm going to surrender all for the glory of God. And that's the goal that what we have right now is to rekindle that dream in our lives so that it's not just something we pay lip service to, but it is something that is an obsession. It's something that drives us. It's something that lives in us, something that consumes us and obsesses us, that turns into a deep cry in our heart, Oh, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the other part of that passage is interesting, though it tarries, wait for it. Why do you think that word needs to be in there? It's because so many people have caught the dream at one point. Sometimes you get it on a Sunday morning, but by Tuesday morning it's gone. Sometimes people start to hope in the dream and believe in the dream, kind of like Joseph got his dream as a little boy. And then everything went backwards compared to what you might expect. And instead of being exalted, he was humbled and laid low and eventually landing in a prison. And you would think, how could this dream come to pass? But the word says, though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come. And and so... That second part of that word is don't lose heart. Stir yourself up to dare to believe again. Let the walls that we put up because we're afraid of being disappointed. We're afraid of being discouraged. We're afraid of being um, let down again. Let those walls come down and dare to believe again. Because those same walls that are meant to protect us from getting hurt are the same walls that keep the light of his glory out of our life. They rob us of the fullness of joy and life that's in King Jesus. And it's time to let those walls come down in Jesus' mighty name. 
You see, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hid in a field. And when a person finds that treasure, they will sell all that they have to possess it. And I have to ask us this morning, is that who he is in our lives right now? Because if Jesus isn't so wonderful in your life, if his kingdom isn't so real and so beautiful, if it's not consuming your whole life, we're being robbed of what is normal Christianity. And it's time to go back to Bethel. Go back to where we met with the Lord. It's time to ask and receive the Holy Spirit until it is that pearl of great price once again, until it is that treasure that is worth more than everything else in our life. And then we will say to the nations, taste and see that the Lord is good. If we can't say taste and see that the Lord is good, we've lost our testimony. We've lost the power to infect a world with the dream or the vision of King Jesus. And we stop reproducing. We stop reproducing. It is time to kindle again that dream in our lives. Then Bishop Ron continued that series on vision, and he said, what is the big vision? Ultimately, it's Jesus. But it's his kingdom, his rule, his dominion over all things. That kingdom that was lost in the fall, that was restored through the blood that was shed at Calvary, in which came and manifested in itself in power on the day of Pentecost. And, and the vision, see God gives his vision to each one of us personally in our lives. He gives his vision to, our, to bodies, churches, and to groups and organizations but Bishop Ron was pointing out that all of those small visions are playing a role in the big vision, which is the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us. And with that in mind, we have to see it kind of like an army. See, an army, let's say you're going to war. And I'll give you a kind of, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but let's say that we have, you know, I know it's stereotypical, but we always use the Nazis. And why do we do that? There were so many tyrants, there were so many evil regimes, there were so many things that have happened in world history that were just as bad, if not worse than. But what has happened is that Jews, in their wisdom, have not let us forget what Nazi Germany has done, so that they have become kind of an icon to cause us to remember, don't let this happen. But imagine this army is going through um, the nations, and they're bringing the reign of terror to nations, and somebody rises up and says, ah, this is evil. I'm going to go out and fight it. And they go and they grab a rifle, and they go and they stand against this army, and they see tanks coming and planes coming and soldiers coming, do you need a prophet to tell you what the end result's going to be? <laughs> that guy's going to die, right? But if there is an army that is of the size and has the training and has all the equipment necessary, plus the favor of God, goes and takes down that army toe-to-toe, -to -toe, then... They can be overcome. But those soldiers that are on the front line, that is the mission. Overcome that army. Stop the reign of terror. But those soldiers on that front line require a whole infrastructure behind them. All doing different things like making ammunition, putting food together, sending it to the troops online, taking care of those who have been wounded. You see, there's whole organization behind those troops that are fighting that are necessary to fulfill the vision, to fulfill the dream, to fulfill the mission. And each regiment, every battalion, every group that is part of that movement all has a different um, specific mission, all flowing into the big mission. And that's what each one of our lives are. 
That's what every body in church is. We have been given specific responsibilities to play in that big mission. If we lose sight of the big mission, then a different mission gets hold of the hearts of the people. The big mission will be leisure, entertainment, having fun. It could be a host of things. But when the big mission is to see the kingdom of God break through and liberate those who are in bondage to sin and death. Then each individual wakes up in a calling and an anointing, and every body wakes up in a calling and anointing. And so it was in that context that Bishop Ron talked about the calling that was on our church. And the way he said it is this, that Life Springs Church has been commissioned to be a forerunner a pioneer that takes territory for the kingdom of God and sets generations and nations on fire. That is the vision of this church. You see, it's not, we do want to see this church filled. And we want to see a people loving one another and serving one another. But we don't want to be a church that says, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We're going to heaven because Jesus died for our sins, but they're all going to hell. We don't want to be a church that says, oh, it's so good to be in the presence of the Lord, while people that Jesus shed his blood for are out there living in bondage to sin, bound by the darkness, oppressed and living in hell on earth. So God has put something in this church that says whatever the cost, we need to get the kingdom beyond these four walls and turn the tide for generations and nations. You see... Revival is not a good enough word for what God has put in the heart of this church. Revival is the first step. What I mean by that is revival means to live again. And that's what this whole series has been about. Live again. Dream again. Believe again. Reconnect with the mission that God has placed in this community. But the, but the vision is not revival. Revival. The only two words that I can think that can accurately describe it is reformation and a great awakening. We need to reawaken this nation. We need to reawaken this generation to the beauty and the wonder of King Jesus and the practical implications that it bears to a world in darkness. And that is the big mission. And because that is the mission... <laughs> The enemy knows what will happen if we are revived. And so don't think it's strange when fiery trials come in your life. But know this, if we will keep that vision ahead of us, keep that dream ahead of us, we will prevail in Jesus' name. When I think about this vision that God has placed in this church, there's a couple... Um, scriptures or passages that comes to my mind. The first one is the Israelites, when, Jesus, well, when God, Jesus, the same, visited them in Egypt through Moses and brought them out. The vision wasn't to bring them out of Egypt. The vision was to bring them into the promised land, right? The vision was to bring them into the promised land. And it required signs, wonders, and miracles. It required a power encounter between God and Pharaoh. And not only did the Egyptians know that this was the hand of God, the nations all around knew this is the hand of God. And then God brought them out of Egypt, and he was with them with a cloud by day and a pillar by night. He fed the manna from heaven. How could a generation see so many signs and wonders and miracles? How could they see such glorious manifestations of the kingdom of God? And yet, when their moment of destiny came before them, go and take the land. Their perception, their vision was not that God is in our midst. He is Lord. He is King. He has given us all power and authority. It was, we are grasshoppers in the midst of giants. It would be better that I go back to Egypt. You see, this is that second part 
Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will surely come. Bishop Ron has been trying to get us to reconnect with the mission and vision that God has put in this church from the beginning. And it will surely come. But it's waiting for a generation to dare to believe and enter in. But it's not enough just to believe. You see, we can believe and believe and believe and pat ourselves on the back because of what we believe. But it doesn't bring forth necessarily the substance of the dream. So I think of another story from that same period where Moses went up on the mountain and God showed him in the heavenlies a tabernacle and he could see it all. And God told Moses, make sure that you build it exactly according to the pattern you saw on the mountain. And then he came down from the mountain, and for the next 40 years, he, said, he talked to him about, hey, let me tell you how wonderful this thing is that I saw on the mountain. It was so good. It was so beautiful. Let me tell you all about it. No, that's not what he did. He came down with the blueprints, and he said, build. Go and Build. And God anointed craftsmen to build. He put it in the hearts of the people to give, to build, to cause this dream to become a reality. To invest, to sacrifice, to lay down their lives, to cause that dream to come to reality. It reminds me also of Abraham. God gave him a dream. You're going to have an heir through your wife, Sarah. And though everything seemed to be against that even being humanly possible, at a certain point, Abraham had to make a choice. He had to make a decision. When, Abraham, are you going to get tired of hoping for this? When, Abraham, are you going to be tired of being satisfied with the dream of having a son through Sarah? When, Abraham, will you actually hold in your hands this child of promise? Romans 4, 18 says this about Abraham, who, contrary to hope, what was his hope? His hope was for a son through Sarah, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. At a certain point, we need to wrestle with the promises of God over our life, lives, over our church, over our nation, over this world. We need to wrestle with it until we receive the substance of the things that are hoped for until Isaac is born. And that is what God is trying to do in this church, in this season, in this hour. He wants us to not talk about what God wants to do. He wants us to enter in. He wants us to sacrifice, to build, to lay down, to, uh, to mobilize an army to go. We need, I, I've seen this so many times in the charismatic renewal where people got sidetracked talking about and arguing about we believe in the Holy Spirit and we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they wandered down that argument path so far down that they lost the vision and they quit remembering it's more important to have it active in the midst. They were patting themselves on the back because they believed in the Holy Spirit. They believed in miracles, but they couldn't be found in their midst anymore. But I've been seeing something even more interesting here in this church. And it was something that it was kind of like those Israelites. God gave them manna from heaven every single day. He was in their midst with a cloud and a fire. And yet somehow they missed that he was already there. 
And I've noticed that God has been answering prayers. God has been working miracles. God has been doing signs and wonders regularly here in this church. But he wants to open up our eyes to see that he is Emmanuel. He is present in your life. He is present in this church. He is here. And when you start to see him, it's no longer a hoping, oh God, please show up, to oh my God, you are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are the pearl of great price. You wrap my heart with just one glance he wants us to believe and live again and if that is not how we're living we need revival so after Bishop Ron spoke about this vision for four weeks Buddy Hicks came and it was like Bishop began with the big picture this is what the tabernacle looks like and then Buddy Hicks came and said, here, now let me start to bring you over and show you some of the blueprints. Let me show you some of the practical ways that you can mobilize to be a part of what God wants to do here in the midst. And the first thing that he did is he used an analogy of a football team. And this is such an important point to get across here to us this morning because it is one of the major keys to Reformation. And he said that the church is like a football team in a locker room. And the co they come in, and the coach gives them the strategies for the game. He encourages them. He builds them up. But the game is not in the locker room. It's on the field. And if that team never goes out to the field and plays, they're going to lose. They're never going to be successful. And the purpose of the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that the people can go and bring the nations into the obedience of Christ. The purpose is so that the believers, the ministers who are all here in the midst of the congregation will be thrust out into this world that is bound by darkness and bring the light of his love of his goodness, of his grace, into the marketplace, into the highways and byways, and let the people who are in darkness see a great light. And that message really was the beginning of a great reformation. And it was called the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. We need to recover that again and go and bring everything. See, the, the vision of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, the vision of leaven was the pervasive power of sin to destroy. And so the whole covenant was based on protection. And what would you think of a football team that had a great defense but no offense? They're going to lose. But in the new covenant, that whole imagery shifted. And now the leaven is the pervasive power of the gospel to go and permeate and transform all of the earth. And that's what we are called to be. And the church is meant to be a place that empowers you and equips you to be that. And one of the ways that we do that, as Buddy Hicks brought out, is to have an infectious faith. For some reason, we can't get away from needing to fall in love with Jesus. Duty never infects a generation. Obligation never infects a generation. Hearts that are not madly in love with Jesus, that see how wonderful and beautiful he is. Hearts that are weighed down by the cares and concerns of this world. Hearts that no longer see the beauty of the Lord and the land of the living have no power to infect the nations. And that's why we all have a moral and ethical responsibility to fall in love again with King Jesus. And after Buddy Hicks came, Bishop Ron followed it up with a message called, Where Do We Go From Here? And that message really made me laugh in one sense. And the reason why is because he used Isaiah 40 talking about those who wait upon the Lord. And now I'm getting sidetracked. Forgive me here because it just happened. Rabbit trail. But it's not a full rabbit trail, but you can see the progression. 
you know, make the vision plain. Though it tarries, wait for it. Tarry, tarry, wait. Boom, 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 boom. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And so you see the kind of progression that is followed through Scripture in this word that God is bringing forth in our midst. But what made me laugh about the passage was the, the kind of Bible rabbit trails. Because Bishop Ron, even though he spoke on this passage, he kind of wandered over here into Psalm 103. You know, that God will renew your youth like an eagle. And I have to admit, I never sat and thought about that for a second. Because when you look at Isaiah 40, you think, oh yeah, you'll mount up like wings like an eagle. The highest flying bird, the most majestic bird. The bird that terrifies all its prey. Yeah, that's like what we'll be like if we wait on the Lord. And yet, when you wed it to Psalm 103, you ask the question, well, why are you using an eagle anyway? And then Bishop Ron tells us what happens with eagles. And he says that an eagle, when it start, hits the age 40, goes through a very important crisis in their life where they have to make a decision whether they're going to live or die. Because what has happened is that their beak starts to curve. And then, and so they cannot do what they could do before with their beak and their claws become brittle. And they can't grab their prey and their wings get weighed down so heavy that they can't fly anymore. And they are faced with a critical choice. Shall I live or shall I die? And some eagles take the easy road. And they say, I will die. But other eagles say, I shall live and declare the praises of the Lord in the land of the living. You see, that imagery is the imagery of the cross and resurrection. It's the imagery that every Christian will face multiple times in your life. Because before there is a growth, before there is an exaltation, there's first a death on the cross, a humiliation. And every believer has to take up their cross daily and die to the things of this world. Die to the things that rob them of life. Die to everything that is contrary to the liberty that's in Christ Jesus and live again in him. So Bishop told us this analogy of an eagle to put before us an image that we couldn't pull away from our hearts. And he pointed out that this word to wait on the Lord has to do with being bound together for a purpose. It's bound together for a purpose. It's not just, hey, I'm waiting until my life gets better. I'm waiting until something happens. Because that waiting by default leads to the decision to die. If that eagle would have said, I'll just wait until something happens, that eagle will die. But this eagle, what it does is it, ha it binds itself to a vision. I will live again. I will fly again. I will soar again. And so I will do what I need to do to reconnect with the vision of the kingdom of God. And he busts out his beak and he rips out his talons and he rips out his feathers. And he, then he waits for it to grow again. And that is the calling that God is putting on every one of us here today, that we would bind together in unity for this vision, for this purpose, for this dream, that we would live again. But it's an active binding together to the purposes of God, connecting to the vision, connecting to the dream, and connecting to one another to see it come to pass in Jesus' mighty name. So, Using that imagery, Bishop said, what can we do? And, how, and he used the analogy of an eagle, and he used the beak and the, the talons and the feathers as an analogy of how we can practically go to the next level of reconnecting with the vision. And he said, the first thing we have to do is restore our prayer lives. And that, he said, is the beak, and we need to restore prayer. Every one of us needs to pray and call on the name of the Lord. That it would be said in the annals of heaven that in these days in America, men once again began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
that a people arose and said, let me show you, I know the way, his name is Jesus, and when we do what he said in his word, which is to ask of him, he will give us the nations as our inheritance. I saw that he has covenanted himself that you do not have because you do not ask. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. And something started to stir in the hearts of Americans again that, that faced down every problem facing society, that faced down every problem facing their families, faced down every issue in this world that says it is impossible. And something rose up in them and said nothing is impossible with the God that I serve. Watch, I have access to the throne of grace and I will pray and you will see. Elijah was a man like us and behold, he prayed. God cause us to pray. The third thing, you notice I'm jumping over the second because Bishop says, how's it going to go this morning? I said, I don't know because before I even get to what you asked me to talk about, <laughs> we're going to recap. So the, I was asked to speak about the second thing, so I'm going to jump to the third thing. The third thing is the talents, which was, or not the talents, excuse me, that's what I got. It was the feathers. And it was, when they became weighed down and the eagle couldn't fly, they ripped out everything from their life that robbed them of life, that weighed them down, that kept them from soaring. And Pastor Dave Amstutz will be speaking about that next week. But the talents... The second point was the promises of God. We've got to lay hold of the promises of God if we're going to reconnect with the vision of the kingdom and the vision that is on this house. And I'm just going to read, before I dig into the promises of God, I'm going to read the prophetic call that was on this house from the beginning that came from many, or I shouldn't say many, but numerous prophetic voices, all that could not have known one another. All came at the, in the same season and spoke the same prophetic word over this body, declaring what God's purpose is for us in our mission to fulfill his great commission. And it came from Isaiah 54, 2 through 3. Enlarge the place of your tent, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. See, there's two, there, who knows, one day maybe Bishop will expound upon that mightily. But for time's sake, I'll just point out one thing. That, we, that our descendants will inherit the nations. I'm seeing a generation of young people that will arise and put in order what previous generations let get out of order. That we will impart a dream and a vision and a power from on high to another generation to go and make all those desolate places live again. That as our lives are transformed, we will go and bring rivers of living water to those places that are dry and weary among not just America, but among the nations. That's the prophetic call of this house. And how we embrace that call, how we engage in that call after prayer, is we've got to connect with the promises of God. And there are so many promises, so many promises that you could preach on these promises of God out of Scripture every day for the rest of your life and never exhaust them. So thankfully we're not going to do that today. So I just picked a few promises to focus on that give us little snapshots of the principles and show us what the end game of these promises are. The first promise has to do with individual destiny because we all have an individual destiny. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says this, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, 
that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That passage is so unbelievable to a world that does not believe. It's almost offensive even in religious circles that through these promises we become partakers of the divine nature. Oh my gosh, are you going to go new age on me? No. That's why we also want to have sound doctrine. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. That we have received promises because of what Jesus has done on the cross. That we can become conformed into his image. That his character, his nature, his love can be reproduced in us. That is the end game. To become like him. It is such an important part of Christianity that Eusebius pointed out that though there were many who were anointed in the Old Testament, no other person that was anointed had such authority that those who followed him were given a new name. And that new name we were given is Christians. And why were we given that new name? Because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ through which the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as we go from glory to glory and are being transformed as we see him becoming like him, we become Christ-like. We become Christians. In any Christianity that doesn't make us more loving, that doesn't transform our lives, that doesn't renew us, that doesn't empower us, is not the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. So we need to press in and let that gospel once again transform us. Not a kingdom of talk, but of power. But the other thing, I'll speed it up for time's sake. I'll be done in 12 minutes by the grace of God. The next thing, though, that I wanted to pick out as a promise is that until we become an army in unity, we will never fulfill his purposes in this world. American Christianity is perishing because of individualism. Listen, Jesus said, No house divided against itself shall stand. We need unity in the house of God. We need to become a bride, an army, a single fighting unit. And so when Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi and he said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he said, upon this rock, which is the revelation of Jesus, that he is Lord, that he is Christ, that he is king, that he is ruler, that he has dominion, that he has redeemed us. I will build your personal relationship with me. No, I will build the church. Wait, the church? Yes, the church. I don't like the church because they're all, no, the church. And when we start to realize that God has instituted the church, that it is his institution, that it is his body, that it is his bride, that we are part of his people, it's a covenant people, it's a new family, it's a new household, and we start to live like it and act like it and function like it, then we will start to come together and take on everything of darkness in this world. See, this is the big vision that needs to be restored in this hour in America. Unity. We are one body. We are one bride. We are one people. Until we restore that, we will never have the power to overcome. And the promise that Jesus gave to Peter that day is, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell are not what comes against you. But the commission is go, bring all the world under the reign of God's love. That's loving. That is good. That's what you do if you actually care about evil in the world. If you care about real human beings, you want to apologetically preach the gospel. And the gates of hell will not prevail when the church is what it's meant to be, a body and a bride. 
But then, for time's sake, and this all comes together with one thing in Scripture, and Bishop brought this out from the beginning. Tarry, the vision, though it tarries, wait for it. Those who tarry, wait. And then he found another tarry. And this is the big tarry. This is the thing that changes everything. This is the game changer. And it's referred to in scripture as the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, be bound together under this dream in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. There is no Christianity without Pentecost. There is no Christianity without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the church is dead and impotent. It's lifeless and has no power to, uh, to deal with the darkness that is running rampant on the earth. See, we have so many Christians in America who love Jesus, who love the Lord. But we're not having nearly the impact of 120 in the upper room. Because they were told to tarry, to wait for the promise of the Father. In one heart, in one mind, in one accord, in unity, as a bride, as a people, as the institution, the church. When these things come together, power is released that can deal with all the powers of darkness in the world. John 16, 14 through 15 says this, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said he will take of what is mine and declare it unto you. The Holy Spirit, when it says he declares something, when God declares something, it leaps into being. You see, God spoke the word and the nation of the world leapt into being. The Holy Spirit takes what belongs to Jesus it makes it real in our life. It makes it real in our midst. Without the Holy Spirit, all we have is a dream. With the Holy Spirit, the reality of the kingdom of God is manifested in our midst. Hmm. I already talked about this, but that promise to prayer, if you, know, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children... And the God or Jesus is giving us this dream or this vision or this pictorial. Give good gifts to your children, right? We all want to do that. What could be the best gift that we could receive from God? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? John the Baptist, when he spoke about Jesus, he says, the one who comes after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloose. He's the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus said, I came to kindle fire on the earth, and oh, how burned and constrained I am until it is kindled. This is the vision that takes the dream and makes it a reality. The Holy Spirit living and active and moving in our church. Hmm. Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Is that not a promise? A promise you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh? How? Walk in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. How does that come? Come, Holy Spirit, and cause us to bear the fruit of King Jesus in this world. The Holy Spirit is more than just power to do signs and wonders and miracles. It's more than just to give us boldness. The Holy Spirit takes all that belongs to Jesus and declares it through us to a world broken by sin so that they see a light shining, a city set on a hill, so that they're attracted to the brightness of our shining. 
and they come and they grab us each with somebody on each side and says, let us go to the house of the Lord for I can see Emmanuel. I can see he is in your midst. But how can they see he's in our midst if we don't see that he's in our midst? So this is really what I wanted to emphasize in the last four minutes is Christian community in the Holy Ghost. I see, when I was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, I was plucked like somebody out there in left field. And I fell down on my knees and I said, Lord, you're so wonderful. You're so beautiful. That's, this is not what they told me in church. You're not a God who is far away. You're here. You're real. And you're beautiful. And you're wonderful. And you're glorious. And you're worth everything. And, and nothing else had any hold because of the beauty of the Lord. And then I got caught up and I started to find a community of people where the whole, they had, who had discovered the Holy Spirit and the stories that they told were just so amazing where somebody would come in, had come into town and he said, I came into this town and, and a waitress there came right up to me and said, your name is such and such, you come from such and such, you're, this is the word of the Lord for you right now. God told me two days ago that you would be coming in here. Boom, God is real. Another friend of mine, Tim Green, he said that he came. To, he has the X-rays. He had cancer in his back, and uh, his parents flew him everywhere to um, try to get doctors to help him, and they couldn't find any help. And so finally, they said, "Can you come to a prayer group, and we'll pray for you?" And he said, "I didn't want to go, but I felt guilty because they had spent so much money trying to get me well that I agreed to go. But I tell you, he said, I did not want to be healed." Because I knew that if I was healed, I'd have to deal with the fact that God is real and how I was living was not right. And he was healed, and he's been following the Lord ever since. But the thing that really... See, I've been seeing that these, thing, these same kind of miracles are happening regularly in our church, even to this very moment. But the difference is... It's like the manna every day, the cloud by day and the fire by night. Joshua and Caleb saw it. They understood it. They let it touch their heart. They let it transform them. They let it develop the faith and the love and the worship and adoration. It, drew, it developed the revelation of the kingdom in their life. But somehow all the rest of the people were disconnected from the reality of Christ in their midst. We need to reconnect with Christ in our midst if we're going to fulfill that vision because he is here. He's in your life. He is with you. He is with us. And when we see it again, then our hearts overflow with praise and thanksgiving. You see, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is actually walking in love, living like Jesus, being Christ-like. But that's not enough. That's not the full kingdom. It's also in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And if you're lacking any of these three, you're being robbed of what God has for you right here, right now, today, in this hour. The Bible says, as we heard this morning, do not be drunk on wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto God. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it shines like a light in our eyes. It flows like a river out of our belly. Thanks and praise and worship and adoration, even in the midst of trials and difficulties and busyness and stress and, and all the other things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that is the revival that leads to the reformation that we need to see on this earth. We need to revive ourselves in Jesus' mighty name. So I'll close it up with this kind of final picture. Because we need to wake up before the world is going to wake up. And we need to realize that we are in a war. As Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. And the enemy knows what 
God wants to do in our midst. And so fiery darts have been attacking people left and right. Trying to weigh you down and make you feel that you're not worth anything. Making you feel insignificant. Trying to get you to doubt the goodness of God in your life. To doubt that he's with you. To doubt that he'll do anything. Trying to get you to be worried about what shall we eat or what shall we wear. Trying to get you weighed down with stress and anger or bitterness or feeling that nobody loves you. And it's all a strategic attack to try to keep you disconnected from the king of glory who is in your life today, in your midst today. And we need to fight the good fight of faith, reconnect with the vision, reconnect with the revelation, and let Jesus revive us and renew us and fill us with his Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I think because of time, I did pretty good but also because of what the content of this message is. I'd like us all to just stand up and agree in our hearts before the Lord that God would reconnect us with this vision, with this dream, and that he would create authentic, Pentecostal, apostolic Christian community here in our midst. But I, I would like to invite Bishop Ron to pray for us while we agree because God stirred it upon his heart as the father of this house to see this dream that was put in his heart, Psalm 133, from the beginning to finally be manifested here in this hour in Jesus' name. Yeah, I want to share something with you. I was sitting there and listening to our brother Pastor Bill Brannon, and I was thanking the Holy Spirit for just downloading into him. I mean, he got it. Matter of fact, I was sitting there saying, Holy Spirit, download it into me where I can get it even better too. You know, if a leader can't humble himself, he can't lead anybody. Y'all, did you catch what I said? I'll give honor where honor is due, and I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit is all over Bill. This message was like, it's elect, at least it was for me. Anybody? This is what I feel like the Holy Spirit is wanting to do, to read this word, reconnect. I'm saying this for myself. I, I want to reconnect. I want to be baptized afresh and anew in the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to go back and read, because the same thing he was saying, I've been talking to the Lord about going back to that Bethel where you first met Christ and you fell in love with him all over again. You got goofy. Remember how goofy you were? I was real goofy. So I want to get drunk in love and be goofy for Jesus, if you, know, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, if that's speaking to you, I want Bill to take this anointing oil and... You know, it doesn't have to be no long, lengthy prayer and everything over everybody, but just come up here, and I'll, I'm going to have Bill, and I'm going to be the first one to stand in line. I want him to anoint me so I can uh, have that fresh and a new anointing and falling in love with Jesus again. And if that's you, it's speaking to you, then just come on up here, and Bill just come by, and he will just speak some words over you and anoint you with that oil. Whatever it is that you're needing, come on up. Thank you, Lord.